This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning, everyone. And it's nice to see all of you here today. And uh, what a wonderful, beautiful day for us to gather here in God's house for this time of worship. And for our call to worship uh, this morning, I've chosen um, Psalm 121, I think, which is a wonderful passage of comfort. And, uh, and so I invite you to please stand for the call to worship. And this is from that section in the Psalms known as the Psalms of Ascent. And so the Israelites would sing these as they were heading up uh, to Jerusalem from the countryside. And so their eyes are, are upward, looking up toward the temple. And uh, the psalmist writes, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. And let's join our, our voices in singing. Uh, we're going to sing, May the Mind of Christ My Savior. Let's bow in prayer. Almighty God, we do not see the glory. We do not yet see the glory you plan for all humankind, but in faith, we do see Jesus. We thank you for the humility and holiness in which he lived and died. We praise you that he freed us from our sin, that he comforts and strengthens us through our struggles, and that he gives us courage to follow him. For this, we now join with all creation and shout for joy, holy, 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 for you are indeed Lord of all. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, we have been welcomed here by the Lord. Let's take a few moments to welcome each other. I, I need to...
Well, my friends, uh, I believe if we're really honest with ourselves, we, we try to avoid um, confessing our sin before God, uh, largely because we are uh, afraid of what God might think. And, and yet, a beautiful part of God's word is that it assures us, even in the midst of confession, that he, that he does love us. So we're called to confession this morning from uh, 1 John chapter 1, where John writes, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we con confess our sin, he who is faithful will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So in humility and in faith, let's go before God. Let's confess our sin to him. Let's pray. O oh, compassionate God, you are full of mercy for the hurt and the wounded. And we come before you with hearts that should be full of sorrow. For we have sins that everyone, everybody knows and they should be our sorrow. We have sins that nobody knows and they should be our sorrow. Old sins, new sins, sins upon sins, sins of our youth, sins of our age, always more and more sins than we can ever count or want to confess. And now, at least for this moment, they are our sorrow. Help us to acknowledge and bring into the light of your abundant love and mercy all of our sin and sorrow. And we thank you for your forgiveness made possible through your Son, Jesus Christ. Our assurance, O oh compassionate God, is that earth has no sorrows that heaven cannot heal and forgive. Thank you for that assurance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And then from Jeremiah chapter 33 we read, I will cleanse them from all the guilt of their sin against me, and I will forgive all the guilt of their sin and rebellion against me. What marvelous assurance that is. And so, dear friends, hear this good news that your sins are forgiven through Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, friends, also, uh, this is our opportunity to come before God in a time of prayer. And, and my goodness, our, our prayer sheet for this week was uh, full of, of many needs for us to pray for. And so uh, um, let's continue to pray for our friend uh, Adrian as he is uh, uh, doing therapy at Mary Freebed. Uh, I got a little update from Rena this morning that uh, Les no longer has to receive uh, home IVs. And that's a blessed good news because that is uh, about a two-hour process. Was that every day or a couple of Ah, uh, so, so that's, a, that's a huge burden lifted, and so we're grateful for that. Uh, we want to uh, continue to pray for uh, Nancy Smith. As, uh, uh, though there is a large mass on, on her kidney, uh, at this point they're going to take a wait-and-see uh, approach, perhaps treat it with some medications. Uh, we also um, remember, uh, we want to pray for Bobby Spitzner. This is her last Sunday with us. Tuesday, she's flying south to Fort Myers and to take up residence there. So we will miss you, Bobby. What's that? Yeah. And so we'll pray that you have a, a safe journey and that you'll get settled in uh, in your new uh, um, the new home that you have waiting for you there. Also, we want to be in prayer for uh, the Johnny uh, Oatman family from Wayland, Wayland CRC. Johnny was um, killed uh, uh, on, a, on a four by four accident. Uh, he was stopping and he got hit by a car. We also want to pray for uh, the individual, I don't know who it is, who hit him. Uh, what, a, what a tragedy uh, this is for for the Oatman family, but also for the Wayland CRC congregation as well. And uh, we'll also pray for, continue to pray for Renee's brother Pete, right? And um, 
for Ron McVean uh, because he broke, fell and broke some ribs in his back. Is there anything else that we can pray for this morning? Yes, Randy. Uh, our neighbor, Remy Coburn. A serious turn. Okay, so uh, Randy's reminding us to pray for uh, their neighbor, Rennie Coburn, who a uh, 10-year-old girl who has been dealing with uh, cancer, and she's taken a turn for the worst, so uh, let's remember to pray for her. Yes, Bobby. Yes, we'll pray for her. We'll. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll pray for Jim as well. Is there anything else? Yes, Mary Beth. So many deaths as well, some 200 deaths uh, as a result of Hurricane Helene. So it's a good reminder that we need to continue to pray uh, for all who have been affected by this. Plus, another hurricane is um, anticipated to come in this week and, and sweep across uh, um, Florida again. And so uh, devastation upon devastation. So we'll remember them in our prayers. Yes, Ron. Wow, that's great, Lorraine. Now you can climb on your counters again, right? And <laughs> am I on to you? <laughs> so that's, I'm sorry, I'd make a, a little fun with Lorraine, but uh, uh, the prayer of Thanksgiving, she's uh, completed her uh, her rehab therapy, and I tease her because she likes to climb on counters to reach the upper cabinets, and so we hope you don't do that, Lorraine, um, but that's good news, and we want to thank God for that. Anyone else? Yes, Joan. Okay, we'll pray for Joan's uh, son-in-law, James Baker, uh, doing great. We're praying, we're praising God for these good reports. And yeah. so, yeah, indeed. Yes, yeah, Sue. So Sue's asking us to pray for uh, Bruce's nephew who's in Thailand. Uh, they've experienced a lot of flooding there and it um, uh, can be a very dangerous situation for them. So uh, the, 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 the natural disasters aren't confined just to the U.S. There's other events going on in other parts of the world. Yes, indeed. Anything else? Yes, Mary. You're having more surgery? Okay, so Mary's having uh, some ortho orthoscopic knee surgery. Is it this week or the 17th in, in about uh, 10 days? So we're gonna pray for you some more and we hope that you bounce back as well as you did from your, from your hip surgery, right? And did I see a hand over here? No? Oh, yes, Linda.
Yeah. So Linda's asking us to pray for a young girl by the name of Jasmine, who attempted to take her life, is in the hospital now and uh, in dire straits, and we want to pray for her and for healing, not just for her physical injuries, but also healing in her soul. Yes, Rena. I dropped off two grandkids at Sun Life Camp this weekend for a good time and fellowship and talking about God uh -huh. and tears. And I am so thankful for places like that, uh -huh. any camp, any Christian camp, yeah. that you can bring your kids to and get some um, good knowledge about God. So please pray for that camp and also the other camp that, that help our kids. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say something in my sermon about I was a summer camp counselor at, oh. Cam at Camp Roger in Belding, and so I, I resonate with, with that. And so we're thankful. Rena's just being thankful for uh, Christian camps where uh, her grandkids, who she dropped off for the weekend at Sun Life Camp, can um, learn more about Jesus and a relationship with him. Yes, yeah, indeed. Anyone else? Okay, this, we have a big list today, so let's bow our heads in this time of prayer. Well, Lord our God and Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this wonderful day where we, we get to gather together here as your people in this time and in this place. And we're thankful, Lord, for this fellowship uh, that we have with each other, but also for the fellowship we enjoy with you together in this place time and in this place. We're thankful for your son, Jesus Christ, who you sent to be our Savior and Lord. We're thankful for his, his life, his ministry, his death on the cross, his resurrection from the grave, and his ascension in, into heaven at, to be at your right hand. And because of all that he has done, he has repaired the the barrier between us and you caused by our sin, that we can live in confident assurance of our sins forgiven and eternal life at your right hand. And what a beautiful, marvelous gift that is. And as we heard already this morning, we have many prayer requests. We have concerns, but we also have joys. And that too is... Uh, a beautiful part of the fellowship we enjoy as, as Christians is that we can support and encourage each other. We can celebrate as well with each other when, when we recognize the blessings that come from your hand. And so in this day, we, we pray for, for Bob, Bobby Spitzer as she will be leaving our fellowship to go to Florida, to move to Florida. We pray that you will be with her this week as uh, she flies down to Florida and her belongings will follow and we pray as she settles into this new community that you will bless her with, with, a, with a good and supportive community. We pray for her son Jim and pray that you will continue to, to be with him as he uh, has a long journey uh, of recovery ahead of him. Please bless him with your presence and with your healing power. And Father, we also uh, lift up our friend uh, Adrian Vandenacker as he continues uh, his time in the hospital and now as he progresses into rehabilitation, we pray that you'll bless him with, with continued healing, increased mobility, and we ask, Father, that uh, through this good hospital, through these caring people, that uh, Adrian will soon be able to return home and in the meantime, we pray that you'll be with Wilma. Bless her with uh, peace in this time that you are looking after Adrian. Bless her uh, with, uh, with strength and safety and, and just be with this dear, dear couple in their time of need. We pray also for Renee's brother, Pete Mulder. We pray uh, 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 as, as he's been diagnosed with this mass on uh, his kidney that you'll be with his doctors as they uh, determine a next course. And if it, in, it means surgery, we pray that, that he will endure this procedure well, that you will uh, use these surgeons to, to be instruments of your healing. We pray also for Ron McVean, McVean as he 
uh, fell, broke some bones in his back. We pray too, Father, for, for healing uh, and, the, and the, be with him in the, the long journey of recovery and rehabilitation that he will likely have to go through. We pray that you will be there with him you know, every step of the way. And we pray for Nancy Smith. And, and uh, oh Lord, it, it seems as if waiting is uh, what is necessary and it can be very hard. Uh, but we pray that you'll grant her patience in the waiting. And we pray that uh, as they find other ways to treat this mass, that uh, soon she'll be able to endure uh, a, a more invasive procedure, and, and, but in the long run, Lord, we're praying that you bring healing to her, uh, no matter how long it takes. And we pray also for less. Uh, we're thankful that he's doing so well. We're thankful that uh, he no longer has to receive home IVs, and uh, that is just a sign of wonderful progress. And so we thank you for that. We pray that you will continue to be with he and Rena, continue to, to um, bless them in, in this journey that they're under. We pray, Father, that you will continue your healing work. And Father, uh, we pray also for uh, the Johnny Oatman family and the Whalen CRC in this sudden uh, loss of Johnny. We pray that you will comfort the family as they grieve this, this loss. We pray for the driver uh, in this accident, too, that he, too, may experience your comfort, your peace, and, and most of all, Lord, may he experience your grace in this time as well. What a, what a difficult thing to have happen when a, a tragedy like this strikes. It reminds us that it affects so many, O oh Lord, and so we pray. We pray that you'll be with this community in this time. We pray that you'll be with Mary as she undergoes some more uh, uh, surgery, on her, this time on her knee. We pray uh, that you'll be with her as well and that this surgery uh, will go well and that she will uh, heal quickly and regain mobi mobility quickly following this, this procedure. And we pray most of all that you will bless her with your comfort and your presence. And Father, we also pray for uh, this uh, young girl, Jasmine, who attempted to take her life this past week. We grieve, Lord, every time an event like this takes place. And undoubtedly, there were um, many, many factors in leading her to do this. We pray that you will be with her and her family. We pray that you will bring healing uh, to her, not just to the injuries that she endured, but also healing uh, for her soul. And we pray, Father, that she will feel the love and support of her family and, and the community that she is in. We pray, Father, uh, that you will bring your love and grace and mercy to bear on, on her life. We also pray for Rennie Coburn as uh, uh, her cancer uh, has, uh, has taken a serious turn. Oh Lord, it, it grieves us to hear of uh, children like this having to endure such serious uh, health concerns. We pray for Rennie, we pray for her family. We pray that you will bring healing uh, to this dear girl, and most of all, Father, be there with them and comfort and support uh, her family and, and Rennie in this time. And, uh, and Lord, we also uh, pray for all those who um, have endured uh, a tragedy as a result of Hurricane Helene. There's been a loss of life, so much flooding and so much damage uh, to property uh, down south, uh, affecting uh, um, countless states. And we ask, Lord God, that, that you be with these communities as they recover. We pray for all of the first responders who are going in to assess needs. We're grateful for all of the, the resources and support that is, 
is uh, traveling into these affected communities and we pray, Father, most of all, uh, that you bring healing and comfort to all those affected by these storms. We pray for those who have lost loved ones. We pray that you will walk with them in this time and continue to bring uh, your grace and mercy and comfort to, to these families. And as a, another storm is anticipated to roll in in the, in the coming days, we pray uh, uh, again for, um, for the uh, potential damage that will occur. And we ask, Lord God, that, that uh, lives will be spared. I pray, we pray, Father, that, that people will be able to, to leave those areas that uh, anticipate uh, uh, um, being under siege from this storm. And Father, most of all, once again, we pray that uh, first responders will be quick to uh, head into the area to assess needs, to provide help and recovery. Events like these and all we've prayed for this morning remind us that our lives are in your hands and so we pray, Father, that you will continue to hold all of us near, near to you. We give thanks also, Father, for uh, Lorraine and the, the remarkable uh, progress she has made such that she no longer has to go through uh, uh, physical therapy. And for that, we give you thanks for, for this. We give you thanks as well for Joan's son-in-law, James, as he is doing great following um, his heart event, and we thank you for the wonderful healing that has taken place. And also, Lord, we're mindful that, uh, as we've already said, that uh, there are ev weather events going on around the world, and so we pray for Bruce's nephew. As he and his family are uh, enduring times of flooding there, many colleagues have, uh, are also being affected by this, and so we pray for these communities affected by flooding there as well. And we pray that supplies will be getting in to those in need. We pray for uh, the first responders and, and for all of the responders re responding to these various needs, Lord, we pray that they will have an abundance, a deep capacity for compassion. And in all of this, Lord, may your name be glorified and Lord, we thank you. We thank you for uh, this season of the year as well, and, and that we can bring in the harvest, and we're grateful that uh, it's going so well. We pray that you'll continue to bless all the farmers uh, who are out in the fields every day bringing in crop. We pray that you will keep them safe and in your care at this time as well. And then, Lord, as we worship you with our gifts and our offerings, we pray that you'll bless us as we give back to you a portion of that which you provided. Bless the, the general fund and the ministry shares for, of this church. Help us to continue meeting our obligations. But most of all, Lord, in giving, we pray that many, many will come to know your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. All this we ask in his name alone. Amen. Well, friends, I invite you now to worship God with your gifts. I invite the deacons to come forward. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good with every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. 
You have led me through the fire in the darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. And all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Amen. Thank you, Sarah and Roz. That was beautiful. Um, I forgot something during the prayer time. Uh, Nancy um, Mingerink asked me to um, um, say that we have a little packet on the back uh, remembering Gord Gurink, who celebrated his 100th birthday yesterday. And so I was just flipping through this. What an interesting life this man has lived. And uh, he celebrated 100 years yesterday. So if you would like to learn more about Gord's uh, fascinating life, you'll find it on uh, the back counter uh, in the foyer. Well, friends, let's open God's word to uh, Luke chapter 6. We continue with our uh, series on the fruit of the Spirit. And today we look at the fruit of goodness. And before we read God's word, let's bow for a moment in prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, we ask that you interrupt us in this moment with your presence. Intrude upon our preoccupation, our restlessness, our discontent, and our boredom that we might focus our hearts and minds on your word as it is read and proclaimed. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And I said Menkerink, and I meant Meniger. I'm sorry, Nancy, for saying that. And you're celebrating 85 years, and I, I and so we want to wish you a happy birthday this week, and we'll, we'll clap you on the back after the service in the foyer. So let's read together from uh, Luke chapter 6. A tree and its fruit. And Dr. Luke uh, writes this, Jesus says, No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. This is the word of our Lord. Well, friends, uh, this morning in, our pas- in a passage just prior to what we just read, Jesus began his message with some rather famous words, do not judge, do not judge, and you will not be judged. Now, this may be some of the most famous words from the Bible that both Christians and non-Christians can quote. 
And Jesus uses these phrases as a lead into saying something about removing the plank from your own eye before pointing out the speck in your brother or sister's eye. Jesus calls those who do this hypocrites. And the word hypocrites is a word that comes from the theater, interestingly. That is, one who pretends, who, who acts, who wears a mask. When actors act, they are pretending to be someone else. And of course, that is their purpose. And the really, really good ones do it so well that we believe they are actually who they portray. In fact, many actors have built their entire careers around a, a certain character type, such as a villain or a romantic hero, that sort of thing. Some of these actors take great delight in how they have fooled people into thinking they are a type of person they really are not. And so Jesus takes issue with pretending to be who we are not. And in this passage, he dismisses this as totally inappropriate, those who say one thing, but then go on and do another. It, it, it's just like that parenting moment. I'm sure that we have all experienced at one point in another when you've had, had some great tension between you and in one or more of your children, and, and especially when they have caught you in some kind of great inconsistency. I see some smiles right now because you know what I might be saying next because when they catch you in that inconsistency, you might just be prone to blurting out, now son, daughter, do as I say, not as I do. Do you hear me? Come on now, let's be honest. We've probably said that at one time or another, or at least we've thought it. And so as followers of Jesus Christ, we must make our words and our actions consistent. What one is, what one does, and what one uh, says are inseparable. They, they go together just as a tree and its fruit are paired together. It would be like going out to an apple orchard in this uh, time of the year, expecting to pick, to pick apples, but finding pears instead. The accent Jesus is placing on this teaching has to do with what one says. In other words, our speech. Our words reveal what is in our hearts as surely as the appearance of fruit announces what kind of trees are in the orchard. For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. Now Luke's gospel is not alone in paying this much attention to the importance of one's words. Matthew's version of this story adds this, you brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Wow. Those are some pretty strong words and sentiments about goodness from Jesus. The Apostle James in his letter adds to this by making an interesting comparison. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? In fact, the, the entire New Testament objects to the popular expression, it's not what you say, but what you do that counts. It's a good reminder that throughout Dr. Luke's writing, both in this gospel and in the book of Acts, uh, the most common evidence of the presence of the Holy Spirit is found through speaking. The very words that come forth from people who are filled with the Spirit reflect the fruit of the Spirit that we know as goodness. And this means that being and doing good starts with our words because our words reflect what is in our hearts. And our hearts are what produce the fruit. 
And so this means that our words and our actions, they must match up in order for both to be effective. So, a good question for us to ask at this point is this. What do we know, what do we know about goodness? Well, first, we know that God is distinctively good. Goodness is thoroughly a part of God's character and his nature. And so Jesus asks and then answers, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You see, what Jesus is saying about the source of goodness is that there is a distinct and unique goodness about God. The goodness of God is total. It's 100% reliable for he alone is the source of all goodness. And I think we know intuitively that all too often we judge our goodness or the goodness of others on a, what we could call a grading curve. Well, that might work in school, but we know that becomes the wrong scale. We, We might think, well, that person over there, wow, he is really a saint. But that person over there, oh, and notice I'm not pointing at anyone in particular, right? I think we can fill in the blanks ourselves. Oh, that person over there, well, he's dishonest, he's untruthful, so, well, you know, I'm, I'm pretty decent. I fall somewhere in the middle. Well, folks, that's the wrong standard, for it's not based on God's standard on, and on his example of goodness. And this then leads us to consider this. It is hard to call ourselves good in the context of our sinful condition. And and often we can become discouraged then when we think about our sins. And so perhaps this is why we resist naming our sins. When we keep our sinfulness in the category of generalities, so that we can think of ourselves as less sinful than we, we really are. But then we turn to the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was, was, uh, uh, was honest about his sinfulness. I, I would say Paul was brutally honest about his sinfulness when he wrote to the church in Rome, uh, I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. He goes on, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the the evil I do not want to do, this I keep doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is the sin within me that does it. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, Evil is right there with me. Wow. Our prospects for goodness do not seem very very bright in light of this passage. And yet, we shouldn't give up hope, for we have, we do have, the potential for good. We have the capacity for good. And we must always remind ourselves that we were wonderfully created in the image of God. And Paul very truthfully and accurately describes our sinful condition. But then he also, on the other hand, truthfully and accurately wrote to the Ephesians that we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which... God prepared for us in advance. So we must hold on to this in such a way that we let God's word and God's spirit then shape our identity. And so, we're left to wonder, how then do we bridge this gap between our sinful nature and then the calling of God to do good works? Now, it is fair of God to expect us to do good works 
uh, or, or we, maybe we need to ask it this way. I'm sorry. We need to ask it this way. Is it, f- is it fair of God to expect us to do good works when we are saddled and burdened with our sinful nature? Well, we look to the Apostle Paul again. He writes that God's divine power... Oh, I made a mistake. <laughs> Please forgive me. I, I meant the Apostle Peter. He wrote in his second letter that God's divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desire. And then Paul goes on, he adds to this when he writes in Romans, you who are, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the spirit, if the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. So what we can see in all of this is there's that theme of dependence again, which now leads us to consider some of the difficulties that we might have and we do have in cultivating goodness in our lives. And so the first thing we have to understand is that the culture, the context of our, of our days, of our time that we live in has tamed goodness. And Rena, this is when I bring out my summer camp experience to you. I was, uh, when I was uh, in college at Calvin, uh, I served for two summers at Camp Roger, and I would often take my boys on hikes in the woods, and we would look for wild mulberries or blackberries, and usually by about the end of July, I knew right where to find them. And for some of these city kids, they never realize that all the stuff that mom buys at the store and brings home from Meyer had to come from somewhere. You see, the fruit that we all enjoy was at one time wild. And so take, for example, uh, the simple fruit like strawberries. Now, today, strawberries seem so common and natural to this, to us, but at one time, that was not the case. Before they were tamed, strawberries were considered an exotic fruit. And some 800 years ago, many Europeans considered the strawberry unfit for human consumption. It was a wild berry that grew in the woods. And, and so the people of those days saw strawberries as, some, as something that was considered contaminated. It was contaminated because it g- grew close to the ground among all of those snakes and bugs and toads and all that creepy stuff that you find in dark forests, but yet in time, that simple fruit of the strawberry was tamed and cultivated, such that finally in the 1700s, this is my last little factoid, all right, that there was a, a Swedish scientist who ate nothing but strawberries for an entire year to prove that they were indeed edible, and for that, we can give thanks to Sweden, right? They're a delicious fruit. Well, in the same way, we have tamed goodness so that we no longer think it is anything all that special. Tamed goodness is, is common, it's, it's ordinary. We no longer see it as exotic and exciting, so such that if you wanna be a good person, then just don't do anything bad Don't be a lawbreaker, follow the rules, uh, be honest, and then people will consider ourselves good. So we have exchanged goodness for mediocrity. We are often confused about the goal of goodness. You see, goodness is as much a virtue as it is a quality of life. And we get in a, in, a, in a kind of twist because of how we define goodness. And so often we only see goodness as nothing more than 
a feeling. Uh, I want to feel good. In, in fact, how many of us don't put a lot of effort into the goal of every day of feeling good? And so we pursue uh, uh, hobbies or other activities that make us feel good. We take medicine to make us feel good. Uh, in fact, um, I'm at that age where I have two kinds of, uh, of ibuprofen that I keep around the house. I have my bedroom ibuprofen and I have my family room ibuprofen, right? I need them in both of those places. So there's that. And so um, we may not even be critical then of others based on whether or not the people around us make us feel good. So that's first. The, the second thing is, is that after this, we must strive to do good. We must recognize that there are good works, that there are good things that we must do, that we ought to do. And yet, this will mean different things to different people. Uh, some think of it as doing good deeds for strangers. Maybe it's uh, pulling over on the highway to help someone fix a flat tire or, or, or giving uh, a neighbor some help with their farm chores. Or, or maybe it's going on a, a mission trip to, to serve some kind of need in a faraway place. And so maybe it's in moments like these that we recognize that the, good, good, the, the goal of goodness is, third, being good. And so people who are striving to be good will do good. And people who are striving to be good do not get distracted trying to simply feel good. In fact, being good may make you... May, make you, in fact, being good may make you feel good, but sometimes, though, sometimes being good may not feel good at all. And this is when we know that being good is a higher goal than simply feeling good. So think of it this way. If I'm feeling good, I'm not necessarily becoming more like God, but the more I strive to be good, the more I become like God. And so all of this should lead, lead us to look for ways to go, cultivate goodness into our hearts and into our lives. And so for this, I wanna give you three things to consider. And the first is this, it starts with a confession of our sin and of our weaknesses. And yeah, it is, this is difficult, but this is so very important. Until we name the sin that prevents us from cultivating goodness, we will never mature in the Christian life. Ignoring the sin and the weakness in our life keeps us from growing in God's spirit. And, and I think we too easily dismiss the poisonous nature of sin by saying things like this. Well, you know, everybody sins. Yeah, okay, that's true, but that is why it's so bad. Or maybe we might default to this kind of thought pattern. Well, that's just the way I am, so deal with it. I love that. I am what I am, right? As if acknowledging our character flaw gives us then an excuse to continue exercising this flaw with reckless abandon. Friends, we, we shouldn't dismiss our sin so easily. Rather, we must name it. But then naming it doesn't make it worse. It actually opens us up then to healing from a source outside of ourselves, that being God himself. The second thing that we must do is we must pay attention to God's word. In fact, the, the Apostle Paul, he writes to his friend Timothy that all scripture is God-breathed and it is useful for teaching and rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the man or woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. 
Friends, the, the preaching, the reading, and the study of God's Word, this is more than simple information. Doing all of these things is recognizing that God's Word represents a truth that has the power to transform us from the inside out. And so it is my hope and prayer that through the preaching of God's Word, you will respond then to confession and repentance. Why? So that you can be good and so that you will then be equipped for good works. And then third and finally, we, we cultivate goodness through the imitation of mature disciples. In other words, we need role models in our lives. The Apostle Paul, uh, in, for his part, he was bold enough to tell the Corinthian disciples to imitate him because he, in turn, was imitating Jesus Christ. And then when Paul's disciple Titus was trying to build up uh, the church on the island of Crete, he had his work cut out for him. These people had made a mess of their morals. And so Paul then advised Titus to build up mature leaders, men and women who could model the goodness of the Christian life. You see, imitation is also important in our life together as a congregation. We are to be, we are to bring people to Jesus Christ by how honestly we live our lives. No acting, no Academy Award winning productions of how I have my life all together. No, none of that. You see, when we develop honesty in our relationship to Christ, we are then free to admit I'm not very perfect. I'm not perfect at all. And so, friends, mature Christians must model goodness. They must model the other fruit of the Spirit so that others may learn from you. Because the goal of cultivating goodness in our lives is so that we reflect God's grace in our lives. And then that is how we draw others to him. And so we must keep our eyes on this goal with the words of the Apostle Paul in mind that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us this day. And we recognize and we acknowledge, O oh Lord, that this fruit of goodness is difficult for us to cultivate into our lives with integrity. We know that each one of us lives in, with an internal conflict. The conflict of our sins and of our sinful flesh versus what your will is for us. But then, Lord Jesus, we ask that you help us also realize that we cannot uh, do uh, carry on this battle all by ourselves, but only by your Spirit working and active in our lives. So we pray, Father. We pray, Lord Jesus. We pray, O Holy Spirit, that you will work in our hearts and in our lives and keep us mindful that we are all works in progress. And yet your grace can shine through. And we pray that as your grace does shine through, that others will see and notice and will want to know more about the hope that, that we live with. And so we pray that your work in us will be clearly evident. We ask and we pray this in Jesus' name alone. Amen. And friends... Let's stand together. Let's sing, Lord, speak to me.
And dear friends, I invite you now to receive God's parting blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. And may the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.